Yesterday he told me that his first contribution to science was a paper with Mike Gazaniga in which he, Eric's role was to set up a computer, a computer built of uh, relays because in the, in the 60s uh, there were no, uh, uh, no other ways of uh, creating uh, things that would operate, operate automatically and the goal of this machine was to get monkeys, play monkeys in the other task in the home cage, which is something that we try to do today in using somewhat more sophisticated techniques, but that was already, this is what he did already in the 60s. Um, so Eric's uh, contributions to the auditory system are crucial for the way that we understand today uh, how the auditory system works. Both his work on the auditory nerve, on the, auditory, on the cochlear nucleus, and uh, recently on coding of sounds in the, in the inferior colliculus. These are papers which are basic for a, a anyone who wants to understand anything about how things work there. And so it is, uh, uh, I think, a, a great privilege to have him here uh, giving this talk and uh, another one on Thursday. So, Eric. Uh, oh yeah, there's a formal part here. I should give you the... This is the... Don't you want to wait and see how good the talk is? No. <laughs> <laughs> you should open it and read it to the... <coughs> the Heller Lecture Series in Computational Neuroscience Awards is Certificate of Recognition and Appreciation. To Eric D. Young for his contribution to academic inquiry and exchange at the ICNC Edmund Sacra Campus, Steve Brown, Jerusalem. Right on. So, uh, So uh, this lecture is about plasticity, and plasticity, of course, is enormously important uh, in the brain because it's the way the brain organizes itself uh, using rules that have been uh, studied probably more than almost anything else in neuroscience. Uh, the brain manages to make uh, roughly correct connections into correct connections that do good computations for us. However, uh, in when, when, the, when the peripheral receptors are damaged, as in hearing impairment, uh, those rules can go astray. So I, what I want to do is to uh, talk about a few examples uh, which this seems to be the case. And these are the people who really did the work and the people who supported the work. The auditory system, um, most of you are probably familiar at this level, uh, consists of the a peripheral part, the cochlea, which is what our ears lead to, uh, and this is a, a, a remarkably delicate and complex structure which has as its uh, goal uh, accurately encoding the very uh, low energy signals that we get in the form of sound from the acoustic environment. Um, and the details of this don't matter here, but this does matter. Almost all hearing impairment uh, 
is caused by damage to the cochlea. Right. So one or another element of the cochlea, and this slide is part of a, a lengthy discussion of that, uh, but for the, for the purposes of this talk, uh, the transducer cells, these hair cells, inner and outer hair cells here, uh, are the cells that convert the mechanical motions of parts of the cochlea uh, caused by sound, that is the mechanical energy and sound into electrical energy, which is used to, uh, to drive auditory nerve fibers here called spiral ganglion neurons, uh, and they convey that information into the central nervous system. So almost all hearing impairment is caused by damage in one form or the other to the function of the hair cells or to the hair cells themselves or to the spiral ganglion neurons, uh, the auditory nerve fibers. Um, however, uh, what I want to convey today is that uh, uh, damage, secondary damage to the circuitry of the brain, of the central nervous system, uh, can be just as big a problem. So that, just to start at the very beginning, this shows the, the problem in hearing impairment, almost all hearing impairment, uh, is, is, is caused by the inability to hear sound, right? That's the basic problem. That's not the only problem, but that's the basic problem. And this is the way you normally look at that. So this is frequency of sounds, uh, right, from low to high. And this is the loudness of sounds. Normally, we can hear sounds uh, at about these intents. So this is loud, this is soft. Normally, we can hear sounds uh, around this intensity between 0 and 20 dB uh, at, across the frequency scale, the human frequency scale. And this is a person with a so-called high frequency hearing loss, which is a common kind of hearing loss. This is the sort of hearing loss that generally leads to the use of a hearing aid. Uh, and this person has pretty normal thresholds at low frequencies uh, and elevated thresholds at high frequencies. Uh, there's some other, uh, yeah, so no, and, and elevated thresholds at high frequencies. Now, uh, on the basis of the, the idea uh, that the problem with hearing impairment is the inability to hear sound, uh, a method called the articulation index was developed to, um, to predict uh, the effects of uh, uh, not only hearing impair impairment, but lousy telephones. This work was actually done mostly by telephone engineers in various places in the world, including Bell Labs. Uh, and the idea was that uh, in order to hear and understand speech, uh, you have to understand sounds over this range of frequencies uh, and this range of intensities. That is, within this sort of cigar-shaped region here, uh, most of the energy that, that's necessary for speech uh, is found. And so you could predict uh, the, the quality of the telephone or the uh, degree of impairment that a hearing impaired person has by uh, adding up the area of speech that can be heard as a fraction of the total area of speech. Right. Very simple idea. And th there are a couple of, of steps, there are a couple of fudge factors that have to be put in. And these fudge factors are computed uh, from normal listeners by filtering the sounds to take out frequencies and by adding background noise so the frequencies could not be heard. And then that model, which works very well for normal listeners, uh, was applied to hearing impaired work listeners. And so the idea is that if, if a person's threshold looks like this, so they can't hear these frequencies, they're only hearing about half the speech, then they should have a certain performance in a speech test. Um, and uh, the remarkable thing about this model is that it works pretty well. So um, this shows the articulation index, which is a calculation that's basically the area that can be heard divided by the total area with some nonlinearities and fudge factors, as I said. So that's the x-axis, the prediction of this simple articulation model. Um, and the y-axis is, is the uh, performance of listeners with hearing impairment in a speech discrimination test. And basically, it's proportion uh, correct for words and, and uh, phonemes that are heard. And the line is the, is the relationship between those two predicted by articulation theory. And the data points are data from a number of listeners in the test that was done by Chas Pavlovich a number of years ago. Uh, and this, this method works remarkably well. So the uh, normal listeners are in red squares, and listeners with mild hearing impairments are the blue circles, and the model works really well for them. The model, however, does not work for people with more severe hearing loss. Uh, it also doesn't work for people with, with white hair, like me. 
works less and less well. So there are a variety of reasons for thinking that not all, not that, the, that, the, that the only problem uh, in hearing impaired listeners is in the cochlea, but there are additional problems that they have. So the articulation theory should predict everything about what's wrong in the cochlea, uh, but it doesn't work for everybody. And in fact, people do worse than articulation <coughs> predicts as they get older or as their hearing impairment gets worse. And so therefore, uh, there must be some other problems. And what I'd like to do is to show you that maybe those problems are in the brain. Uh, so the auditory system is a, a complicated mess. And if I really showed you all the connections of the auditory system, uh, this would just be a morass of lines. Uh, but the point about this slide that's important is that the hair cells are here in the cochlea. The auditory nerve fibers are here. They project into a sequence of processing centers in the brainstem. And then ultimately, the uh, inferior colliculus in the midbrain collects all of that information together and connects it to the cortex. So um, in order to make this system work, it has to be wired up properly. And it's a, it's a hard problem because, for example, a neuron in the inferior colliculus here can get inputs from as many as 30 different kinds of neurons uh, in this, in this brainstem collection. So th the point of this is, is simply that it's, that it's, it's complex and there, there are lots of connections that have to be made and those connections have to be properly m set up in the first place and then properly maintained um, in an adult. Now if you take an animal <coughs> and give it an acoustic trauma, present loud sound, sort of rock concert-like loud sound for, um, in this case, three hours, uh, that animal will have a hearing loss that's something like the one I showed you, the human hearing loss that I showed you. It's the kind of hearing loss that's roughly 50 dB of threshold shift, um, uh, the kind of hearing loss that would lead to use of a hearing aid. And if you then uh, go in and look in the cochlear nucleus in the first of these processing centers, I should say that uh, in this talk, almost everything I'll say will be about the cochlear nucleus, uh, with a little bit about the rest of, the, of this system. Uh, sorry, wrong way. Uh, if you go in and look in the cochlear nucleus at various times after the exposure, this is work done in Kent Morris lab by Kim et al., um, you see a gradual uh, disorder of the system. And 16 weeks after the acoustic trauma, uh, the cochlear nucleus is just a mess. So the, this is the number of normal synapses that you see in the microscope. Uh, and you see that the number of normal synapses is about half of what it is uh, initially. And then over the next few months, there's a return of synapses. So by the time you get 32 weeks out, or about eight, um, from the, yeah, uh, eight months out, uh, the number of synapses is back to pretty much normal. So the auditory system is apparently fallen apart as a result of the acoustic trauma and then put itself back together. Is this uh, in the young quest, This is in uh, adult <coughs> cats, I believe. Now on the right, you see the number of degenerating profiles, and this just goes along with, this plot just goes along with this plot in that when there's a minimum number of normal profiles, there's a lot of degenerating profiles. So it's just what I said before, that the system falls apart and then it puts itself back together here. So the question is, what does it look like when it's put back together? How normal is it at that point? And of course, in the process of putting itself back together, it's going to apply the same kind of plasticity rules that it applied when it developed in the first place. Um, so I'm going to give you two kinds of examples of bad things that happen in that reconstructed auditory system. The first one is disorganization of circuits, and the second one is changes in the strength of connections among neurons, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what the effects of those things are. Some of this work is from my lab, and some of the work is from other labs, and I'll try to remember to identify whose work it is. Um, so the, the basic rule of organization of the auditory system is that it's sonotopic, meaning that it preserves uh, information about frequency. So the first thing that happens in the cochlea when sound comes in is that sounds are decomposed into their component frequencies. So this hair cell is stimulated by low frequencies, this hair cell by high frequencies, and that is done by the mechanics of the basal membrane. So each hair cell is stimulated by a narrow range of frequencies, depending on where it sits in the cochlea. It's connected to an auditory nerve fiber, which is sensitive to that same range of frequencies, of course. 
And then the connections in the central nervous system are precise, point to point, and retain this frequency uh, axis here. So that these neurons are just as precisely frequency organized as the cochlea was in the first place. The precision of that uh, organization can be shown by this set of experiments that, was done, that were done by Pat Leake and her colleagues. Uh, and in this case, what was done was to take uh, uh, a cat uh, and give it a, a dose of an of a prototoxic antibiotic, antibiotic that kills all the hair cells. So the hair cells are now gone. Uh, and this is a uh, model preparation for cochlear implants, which, which is what Leek and her colleagues are interested in. So, uh, and, and then put a, a, an electrode into the cochlea and stimulate. So now what you're doing is activating auditory nerve fibers uh, electrically, the way that, that this is done in a cochlear implant. And the question is, um, uh, what do you see over here in the central nervous system? So if you activate this auditory nerve fiber, you ought to activate these cochlear nucleus neurons and these neurons in the inferior colliculus. And uh, if, you, if you then drive a microelectrode through the inferior colliculus, you ought to be able to see a pattern of activation here that reflects where you stimulate in the cochlea. So in the inferior colliculus, the neurons are laid out in a precise frequency fashion. As you drive the electrode down th through, you start with high frequency neurons, and you end up, I'm sorry, with low frequency neurons, and then you end up with high frequency neurons. So recording depth here should correspond to distance along the basal membrane, to frequency. Uh, and the y-axis here is the threshold for a neuron in the inferior colliculus at a particular recording depth. Um, the threshold for stimulation, electrical stimulation in the cochlea. And you imagine then that if this stimulation activates a phonotopic group of fibers, this inferior colliculus neuron ought to be most sensitive to the stimulus site. And these should be less sensitive, and that in fact is what you find. So you end up with a tuning curve here, which reflects the accuracy of the tonotopic mapping from the cochlea to the inferior colliculus. And you see it's pretty accurate. That is, the threshold is lowest at the point in the inferior colliculus, which receives connections from the point in the, in the cochlea that's being stimulated, and the threshold goes up really rapidly as you move away from that point. So this is, this is good. So this is in an animal that's had the hair cells destroyed, and then the recording is done immediately. So there's no chance for this degenerative process that I showed you before to take place. And if you stimulate at a different place in the cochlea, the threshold is lowest at a different place in the inferior colliculus, right? Just like it ought to be. Now, if you do the stimulation chronically for a period of weeks, so that the animal has the electrode in the cochlea all the time that's being stimulated by uh, the responses to environmental sound or by a stimulation protocol, then uh, the pattern you see in the inferior colliculus is different. It's now much broader. Uh, the quality of the tuning is much poorer. So this is, for comparison, the tuning in the acute preparation immediately after loss of the hair cells. And this is in the chronic preparation after several weeks of stimulation. And you see that uh, there's still a best threshold, there's still a apparent tonotopic map, but the quality of the map is much worse because the breadth of this tuning curve is much wider than it was in the original cochlea. So what that suggests is that the circuit is disordered. That is, at minimum, the connections are made over a wider range of cells in the central nervous system than they should be, but perhaps also that the connections are disordered. Uh, there's still a tonotopic map, in the sense that if we move the stimulation site in the periphery, it moves in the, in the central nervous system as well. But uh, everywhere in the cochlea, the, the tuning curve is much broader than it was originally, uh, attesting to this disorganization of the circuit. All right. So what this means is that if you activate um, uh, the central nervous system, uh, I'm sorry, if you activate the cochlea in an abnormal fashion uh, to induce uh, you can induce a, a plasticity which, which results in a disordered uh, central nervous system. The problem in the situation is probably because the electrical stimulus activates the whole auditory nerve simultaneously. So when we listen to the environment, 
uh, different frequencies come in at different times in complicated patterns. And so there's never a time when the whole auditory nerve is activated like that. But in the cochlear implant stimulation, that's exactly what happens. So if you put one cochlear implant electrode in and you stimulate uh, all the neurons in the auditory nerve are activated simultaneously. And by, you know, one of the, one of the basic ideas of neuroplasticity is that neurons that are activated simultaneously will tend to form stronger connections with one another. And that seems to be what's, what's happening here. That is, there's an inappropriate plasticity which is, which is invoked by uh, an inappropriate simulation site in the periphery. Now, an interesting uh, final statement to make about that is that if you look in neurons that, in, in, the, in the cochlea of animals that have uh, a moderate acoustic trauma, say a 50 dB threshold shift, so the hair cells and auditory hair fibers are damaged, but not destroyed, the kind of hearing loss that would result um, in hearing aid use, you see exactly the same kind of widespread activation patterns. Because of changes in the details so the tuning of the auditory periphery uh, and the way in which uh, activity spreads along the basal membrane, there's a tendency for natural sounds to activate the whole basal membrane simultaneously, which ought to have the same uh, inappropriate plasticity effect in the central nervous system. Another example of um, um, changes in the, in the organization of the synaptic structure of the brain following acoustic trauma is provided by the uh, relative strength of excitatory and inhibitory inputs in the brain. So normally, uh, the hair cells pick up sound in the cochlea, convey it through the auditory nerve to the central nervous system, uh, and this goes by excitatory connections to, to neurons that uh, project to other parts of the auditory system and also to local inhibitory inner neurons, the colored neurons here, which inhibit the activity of, of these cells. So if these cells receive both excitation and inhibition, in every part of the brain, including the auditory system. Uh, this is one of my favorite neurons in the auditory system because it has a lot of inhibition. So the, this complicated plot shows you the receptive field or the tuning activity of uh, a particular neuron in the dorsal, so-called dorsal cochlear nucleus. Uh, this is frequency on this axis. And what each one of these plots show is the strength of response to the neuron to different frequencies um, in an experiment where you just play the frequency successively. So the neuron here is like that, and you record the discharge rate of the neuron. Uh, so this is a plot of the discharge rate of the neuron or the response of the neuron as a function of frequency. The horizontal line is the spontaneous activity. So these are excitatory areas, and the colored areas are inhibitory. So this complicated pattern of activity was actually uh, uh, studied by Elaine Elkin and me uh, many, many years ago. Um, and Ellie, in fact, is the guy who figured out what this blue inhibition is here. A very, which, if you go back and read the original paper, it was a masterpiece of scientific logic. Um, that's not, unfortunately, what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is the existence of these inhibitory areas. If you now look at this part of the brain in an animal with a moderate acoustic trauma of the kind that we've been talking about, you don't see these neurons anymore. What you see are neurons that look like this. So notice that the, first of all, the threshold is a lot higher. So this is increasing sound pressure levels. These are soft sounds. These are loud sounds. The neuron no longer responds to these soft sounds. Uh, that, of course, is just because the cochlea no longer responds to soft sounds. But in addition to that, there's no inhibition here. Right? And if you go statistically across a large number of neurons, you see neurons with a little bit of inhibition, neurons with no inhibition. Uh, but on average, you, don't see, uh, you, 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 just, you do not see neurons like this. And on average, you don't see neurons with much more than that much uh, inhibition. So uh, and th this, is, this same result has been gotten in a number of studies in a number of laboratories using a number of different techniques that following acoustic trauma, when the nervous system puts itself back together, there's more excitation and less inhibition. Presumably what that reflects is the fact that uh, uh, the operation of processes that try to keep the neurons active. So when you damage the cochlear periphery, you don't see as much spontaneous activity, and you don't see as much responses to sound because the neurons are not hearing the sound anymore. And so uh, central neurons are turning up their knobs. They're turning up the excitability that, to, to maintain their activity. And as a result of that, 
inhibition gets turned down and excitation gets turned up. But of course, the brain doesn't have all of this inhibition so that we can make pretty pictures. The brain has that because it's important for signal processing. It's important for analysis of sound. So that when you disturb the circuits to this extent, uh, you're, you're going to, to reduce the brain's ability to, to process acoustic stimuli. So that's what I mean by disorganization of circuits. And um, now what I'd like to turn to is a different kind of question that's much simpler, which is a change in connections among neurons. And for this, I have to go through a lengthy, uh, 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 well, side, side light about uh, um, acoustic trauma. So one of the one of the serious problems that hearing impaired listeners have, in addition to not being able to hear sound, is that when they do hear sound, it tends to be too loud, or loudness tends to grow in a way that's unpleasant. And in fact, uh, this phenomenon called loudness recruitment is one of the most <coughs> difficult problems that designers of hearing aids have, because it means that hearing aids can't be simple amplifiers. If they were simple amplifiers and they would amplify soft sounds so they could be heard, but moderate sounds would become way too loud. And so a prominent reason for taking hearing aids out of the air, putting them in the drawer, and forgetting about them, is that uh, they cause this, is, is, is loudness recruitment. What we mean by loudness recruitment is, is illustrated here. And this is a normal ear. This is a hearing impaired ear. This is the physical intensity of the sound. That is, this is the the uh, amplitude of the sound waves coming in the ear measured on a logarithmic scale. And the y-axis is the perceptual intensity of the sound, meaning how loud a person thinks the sound is. So these are done in experiments that seem unlikely, but they actually work quite well. You sit a person down, you play a sound, you say, how loud is it? Give me a number. And the person says eight. And then you, you repeat the experiment a number of times, and people can actually construct a scale in this way uh, that that works reasonably well. Now, if you don't like that, I'll give you a better way to measure loudness in a minute, so don't panic. Um, but the, the general gist is the same as what I'm showing you here. Uh, loudness is near zero at threshold. Um, in the normal ear, threshold is down near zero uh, on, this, uh, on this scale. And loudness increases in this slightly compressive way to about 80 to 100 dB SPL, which is roughly moderate rock concert levels where the sound becomes too loud, and too loud here means uh, you have a tendency to cover your ears or turn away from the sound because it's unpleasantly loud. Uh, in a hearing impaired ear, the threshold is shifted over, say, 50 dB. So this would be a typical hearing aid user. So that zero loudness is now at just the softest sound a person can hear, which is about 50 dB SPL. And loudness increases now more rapidly in that ear than in the normal ear, so that the too loud place is still at about 90 dB SPL. So one of the uh, surprising things about hearing impairment is that the too loud level doesn't move an inch, uh, regardless of how far the threshold moves. Right. So what this means is that the uh, loudness growth is more steep than it otherwise should be. And that leads to the problem with designing hearing aids that I mentioned previously. What this also means is that the di dynamic range of hearing is compressed. So the green line shows the dynamic range of hearing, that is, the total range of loudnesses that we can function over. And it's about 100 dB, uh, and we need that to deal with the world. Right? This is, this is uh, what you get if you hear somebody sneaking into your house in the night, and this is what you get if you go to rock concerts. And normally we work about here in the middle, when we're, like right now when you're listening to me talk. Uh, uh, this person uh, with, a, with a hearing impairment and a threshold shift has a much narrower range, dynamic range, because this is still the upper end of the dynamic range that the lower end has moved over. So um, there's a nice explanation for this and uh, that was provided by uh, Mario Ruggiero and colleagues who, who measured basal membrane motion uh, and was adopted by psychophysicists like Brian Moore, who sort of designed the modern hearing aid. Uh, and the idea is that the motion of the basal membrane is the source of the difficulty. In a normal ear, uh, what I'm plotting here now is a plot similar to this one. This is still the physical intensity of the sound, how loud, is, how intense the sound wave is coming in the ear, and this is the velocity of the basal membrane. So this is the input signal to the hair cells, uh, also on a logarithmic scale. And in a normal ear, this function looks something like this, 
And notice that this slope is less than 1. That is, when this goes up by one log unit from 20 to 40 dB, uh, well, say from 60 to 80 dB, uh, this but this only this goes up quite a bit less than the log <coughs> unit, which would be from 100 to 1,000. So once again, we see a compression. Well, and, and so this is called amplitude compression. This is very important for normal hearing because what it means is that when we operate over this 100 dB SPL range of sound levels here, in this case 80, the way I drew it, uh, the, the cochlea actually <coughs> only has to offer it over about. Uh, a one, one and one and a half log unit over only about 20 or 30 dB here. So that's what we mean by compression. So the, the transducer compresses the sound coming in our ears, uh, compresses its amplitude. And this is what allows us to go from very soft to very loud. In a hearing impaired ear, uh, compression goes away and um, the input output function is linear. That is, when, when the amplitude of the sound goes up by a factor of 20 dB in order of magnitude, the amplitude of the basal membrane velocity also goes up by an order of magnitude. And that is qualitatively, and it's been shown also quantitatively consistent with recruitment. So that seems to be the explanation and the story, uh, but it's not the explanation. And, and, and here's why it's not the explanation. If you look, so, so if that were the explanation for recruitment, then you would have to observe the same phenomenon that is a deepening of the slope of the input-output functions in the auditory nerve fibers, right? So there's a problem out here. That problem's got to be communicated to the brain, so it has to show up here. But it doesn't show up there. Uh, so this shows the input-output functions for these neurons, the auditory nerve fibers. This is the discharge rate or the response of the auditory nerve fiber, and this is the same physical intensity of the sound coming in the ear. And in normal ears, you have a certain slope of this function and in paired ears, you have a different slope. And these slopes, if anything, are less than or equal to these slopes. It's a very noisy measurement. They show actual data. So these show the slopes, that is the slopes of these lines here, uh, just the distribution of slopes. Um, in normal ears, green curve. In hearing impaired ears, that is ears with acoustic trauma, are the red and the orange curves. And so you can see that um, there may be a little bit of decrease of the slope. But there's no increase. And there's certainly not the kind of increase, the, the factor of 3 to 5, that's predicted from basal membrane measurements and from, from recruitment. So how does the information about recruitment get into the brain? And, and my answer to that is it actually happens again in the brain. So let's see the evidence for that. Uh, so what, uh, as I told you before, the auditory system is phototopically organized, and what does loudness mean in terms in neural terms? <coughs> what does loudness mean in neurons? Well, it's probably some measure of the total activity in, in the neural array. So it could be the total activity uh, in the auditory nerve or in the inferior colliculus in all the neurons in the, in the structure, or in the neurons whose which are tuned to frequencies near the frequency that's in the sound you're trying to rate. Something in between those two limits. And an experiment that lets us measure loudness in a, in a very much more precise way than the scaling method I told you earlier, the so-called binaural loudness balance. So for this, you need a listener with one good ear and one bad ear. And there are such listeners. Uh, and what you do is present a sound with the same physical intensity to this ear and then to this ear, uh, and then you ask the person which is louder, and you adjust the physical intensities of the sounds in the two ears until they're equally loud. Okay. Binaural loudness balance. Uh, and in this way, you can, you can tell sort of the, the, the rate of growth of loudness in the two ears. And if you plot the sound pressure level or the physical intensity in the poorer ear, in the damaged ear, versus the physical <coughs> intensity in the better ear, when they sound equally loud, if there were no recruitment, then the data would fall on a, on a line parallel to this one with a slope of 1. So that you increase the, loud, the, the physical intensity in the poorer ear by 20 dB. To match that, you'd have to increase it in the other ear by 20 dB. In fact, the actual data fall on these lines here. Uh, and the fact that the slope of this line is larger than 1 means that the intensity has to grow more rapidly in the better ear than in the poorer ear. And that's because the better ear has compression. 
so that motion of the, of the vascular membrane with the loudness in this area grows more slowly than it does in the recruiting area. Uh, so if this, the steepness of this slope, the extent to which this slope is larger than one, is a measure of recruitment. These just show data from four subjects. And um, so, so this is a, a, a very nice method. Now, we're doing these experiments in animals, of course. And so Brian Moore always raises his hand about this point in talk and says, yeah, I know, but do cats show recruitment if you produce um, a hearing impairment? And the answer is they do. My colleague Brad May did this work. Uh, and I won't go into the details of this because it's kind of involved, but what you do is you use reaction time as a stand-in for loudness. And when you do that, you find that cats recruit just the way humans do if you give a cat a monaural uh, hearing impairment and ask them to do something like uh, binaural loudness matches. All right, so here's an attempt then to apply the binaural loudness match method to uh, to, to recruitment. Um, this this plot shows the total average discharge rate in a population of auditory nerve fibers. Two populations are shown. The total auditory nerve, which is this um, uh, orange dashed line, and just neurons, which are attuned to frequencies near the stimulus frequency, which in this case was uh, one or two kilohertz, I don't remember. So this is this, this ought to be something like the, 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 the total loudness, and this is in the auditory nerve in a normal animal. And this is from the auditory nerves of animals with hearing impairment. And you can see that these slopes are less than the slopes in the normal animals. This slope is less than that slope. This slope is less than that slope, um, sort of. Um, and uh, consistent with so let's do a binaural, a loudness balance experiment with these data and we'll ask uh, what sound level in the impaired ear is necessary to balance the total discharge rate uh, to uh, a certain sound level in the normal ear. That is, pick a level 20 dB in the normal ear and ask how loud the sound has to be in the impaired ear to, to produce the same discharge rate and we'll assume that that means the same loudness. So 20 dB would get plotted against 60 dB. So this is what would happen if there were no recruitment. This is what would happen if there were recruitment as in uh, the listeners that I showed you earlier. Uh, and this is what happens in the actual auditory nerve. And as you see, you don't get a steeper curve, which is what predicts recruitment. You get a less steep curve. You get these two curves, which depend on lots of technical details. The point is that all these technical details don't matter. Uh, the steepness of growth of these functions is smaller than uh, the recruitment value. And therefore, um, in the auditory nerve, you see exactly what we predicted from the slopes that, that, that I showed you earlier. If anything, the, there's recruitment. That is, the, the, the slope of growth of, of the response is steeper, is less steep than, than predicted. Now we'll go into the cochlear nucleus, and uh, you really don't have to pay attention to the details of this. The only point of this is when the auditory nerve comes into the brain, it, it maps onto a number of different kinds of neurons. And these differ in their properties. And I'm going to differentiate the blue neurons and the red neurons for reasons that you'll see in a moment. So uh, the, the answer is that when, when activity from the auditory nerve goes into the brain, uh, in one group of neurons, you see a change in response that's consistent with recruitment. These are the so-called chakra neurons, or most polar cells. Uh, and these show their discharge rates. That is, their responses of these neurons as a function of how loud the stimulus is. In normal cats, you see this dashed line data. And in animals with a 50 dB, roughly, hearing impairment, you see uh, a big increase in the discharge rate and the steepening of the slopes of these functions. So in other words, uh, these neurons have apparently increased the strength of their synapses from auditory nerve fibers. The neurons in the of the other kind, the so-called bushy cells, do the opposite. These are their normal discharge rates. Once again, the dashed data and the solid lines uh, are the data in the impaired here. And you see that the slopes are smaller. The maximum rates are smaller. So apparently, the, their synapses are weaker. But actually, this is consistent with what happens in auditory nerve fibers. So probably, there's really not been any change in these bushy cells. But there's a big change here, a big strengthening of the synapses. And if we now do the, the binaural loudness balance experiment with those data, uh, in the bushy cells we get 
a decrease of slope like we did in auditory nerve fibers, uh, except at very high sound levels. But whereas in the multipolar cells and the other kinds of cells, in these cells that increase their discharge rate, uh, you get exactly what you predict from uh, the data in, in human subjects with, for, for neurons and human subjects with the same degree of threshold shift. Could it not be the case that the cell became more excitable, or rather did the synapse become stronger? Well, they don't, I don't know what you mean by more excitable versus the synapse. Or threshold. Yeah, so they don't become more excitable in the sense that if you record it, you say, are they in these neurons, all matters than this. Uh, their channels are about the same, their electrical thresholds are about the same. So the, there doesn't seem to be a change in the intrinsic excitability of those cells. It seems to be a change in the synapses. Um, uh, and so, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so, what that means is that uh, recruitment seems to happen in the central nervous system. Now, I would like to blame it, suggest that what it really reflects is homeostatic plasticity. That there's a system in all neurons that adjusts the inputs the neurons get and their excitability so that the neurons have uh, moderate levels of activity, reasonable levels of activity. So, in a hearing impaired preparation, uh, spontaneous activity goes away, spontaneous activity in the auditory nerve goes away, uh, and responses to sounds go away because the thresholds are shifted, and therefore uh, neurons in the cochlear nucleus are receiving less in the way of inputs from the auditory nerve than, than in normal animal, and they <coughs> turn up the gain of their synapses. I think that's the most likely explanation of this. So once again, this is an example of which a very useful plasticity for organizing the brain uh, does the wrong thing when it receives um, damaged input from the uh, from the, the periphery, um, so the practical implication of this result is that hearing devices designed to restore normal representation uh, in the auditory nerve uh, must be accompanied by rehabilitation that maintains the wiring of the central auditory system. In other words, we have to do something about the way in which people are treated once they have hearing aids that guarantees that the activity that comes in through the hearing aid uh, works with the plasticity mechanisms, uh, given the faults of the central nervous system to properly uh, adjust or readjust these synapses. Um, and evidence that this can actually be done comes from this very nice experiment by uh, Narenya and Egermont. Um, what this shows is an experiment like those that I showed you in the first part of the talk. Uh, so this, this is the surface of the cortex along two axes of the cortex, and the colors here are the frequencies to which neurons are tuned in different places in the cortex. So this is a standard uh, um, phototopic map for the auditory cortex. Low frequencies produce responses here, mid frequencies here, high frequencies there, the frequency scale is over here. Uh, and this is a sort of normal organization for auditory cortex. Um, if you Produce, uh, if you give a, the cats a mild acoustic trauma, uh, somewhat milder than the ones I've been showing you, then that cortical organization is dramatically changed. Um, and in fact, in, in, in these animals, since the, the hearing losses were high frequency hearing losses, the high frequency responses in the cortex are greatly reduced and replaced by low frequency responses. How soon after the trauma is that? This is very soon after. And this would be a month or so. So uh, then in these animals, in the second group of animals, what was happened is that starting immediately after the trauma and for uh, a period of weeks, the animals uh, were exposed to a so-called enhanced acoustic environment, which meant a, a, a pattern, a multi-frequency, complex background sound, sort of like of varying frequencies going on and off different loudnesses. And the idea that this stimulus was designed to produce activity uh, uniformly along the whole uh, basal membrane, and in, in those animals, the, the damage to the cortical phonotopic map was, was less than it, uh, than it was if you don't do anything. So this is at least um, prima facie evidence that uh, acoustic patterns, that acoustic rehabilitation, I should call it, can be done to, to restore um, uh, normal patterns of activity in the central nervous system. Of course, this is a very crude test, but it's a it's a nice one nevertheless, so that's the one I like to show. Okay, uh, I'm happy to take any questions.
Well, typically you get a hearing aid and you, you go home. Okay. And what are you suggesting should be done? So what I'm suggesting is that uh, uh, you, you need to make sure that the person, uh, first of all, if the hearing aid is, is working properly so, so that the person is hearing sounds across a broad frequency range and that the person has a broad frequency range to, to hear. So there have been experiments along these lines and with varying degrees of success. But do you think it can undo the, the changes in the in the? Well, it depends on. Uh, I mean, one doesn't know, of course, until you try. Uh, one of the problems is that many people with uh, who, who go to get a hearing aid have been resisting it for a long time, and so they've been right. hearing for it for a long time, and so uh, the degree of reversibility of all those kinds of things is uh, no. But I think. Uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the the status of the hearing aid world these days is that the current instruments, the multi-band compression hearing aids, are about as good. They deal with the problems of the cochlea about as well as they ever will. I mean, minor improvements will probably be made, but if you talk to people who do research for hearing aid companies, they generally will tell you that the real problems are improving the other features of hearing aids. In particular, your ability to work in noisy environments, uh, your ability to localize sounds, uh, that sort of thing. So I didn't talk about a whole another ish set of issues here, which is that uh, people lose the ability to deal with uh, so-called auditory fine structure, which means details of the wave shape of the sound, which we use to localize sounds in space. We also use the demask. Um, stimulating complicated environments so that we can hear one voice among many. So all of those problems are probably problems in the central nervous system, not problems in the peripheral. <coughs> Certainly in the case of fine structure, all the information is there in the auditory nerve. It's just not used properly in the brain. So that what we're doing in, in, in this research is just trying to make a start at finding out what's functionally wrong in the central auditory system. It's problem by problem. Assuming a person ha gets a hearing uh, aid, as soon as the hearing loss starts or happens or whatever, then there shouldn't be recruitment. Maybe. Maybe. Right? Well, you know, maybe. Yeah, that would be, what, uh, it, it depends on the nature of the hearing loss, I would say. Right. That's so if, if the hearing loss, uh, so you can, th there are kinds of hearing loss that are sudden and don't damage neural elements in the way that uh, uh, that I showed you. So the acoustic trauma, acoustic trauma is a pretty blunt instrument and it produces some damage to spiral ganglion neurons as well as you know, the auditory nerve fibers as well as the hair cells. And so uh, that makes the, the, plastic, the, you know, the, the, the reorganization of the central auditory system worse than uh, uh, it would be if you had a Called sudden, sudden hearing loss that doesn't seem to involve destruction of neural elements, in which case you might not get as much degeneration in the region. So maybe so. Uh, a personal question. Um, I have a degree of hearing loss that goes with old age, but I have the impression that a large part of my understanding problem has to do with something temporal. In other words, the separation of words in a sentence. Is this well known? Is, is, can you say anything about it? Yeah, the, the most confusing uh, 
chapter in all of hearing impairment is exactly that one. And uh, there's an excellent book on hearing impairment by Brian Moore. And if you read that chapter, at the end of it, you will, you will see that maybe it does, and maybe it does. The temporal effects of hearing impairment are very difficult to understand. And, uh, since Ellie's standing up, but he obviously wants me to sit down. No, 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 no. <laughs> difficult problem. One of the problems is that uh, with hearing impairment you get these other damages of the spectral kind that I showed you were, um, and, and those interfere with your ability to do the rapid processing uh, that's necessary to, to deal with, with, for example, speech where syllables come rapidly. You don't get, it takes you longer to figure out what a particular syllable is than, than a whole string of syllables is going to be harder to process. In other words, I find that the hearing aid uh, is very little help for yeah. that reason. Well, maybe so. Uh, on the other hand, you know, your um, your ability to actually, it's very difficult to find good psychophysical evidence that temporal processing is, is damaged. So, I think the answer is complicated. And I would refer you to Brian Moore. For better discussion. You, you were talking about So that's, I mean, that's, that's the obvious question. That's a good question. And the, the, the temporal, uh, you know, if you make the sound in this ear 20 dB louder than the sound in this ear, you still are very sensitive to interval time differences. We're getting kind of into technical things here. But the, the, the temporal processing, the interval time difference part of processing part of the brain still works pretty well, even though there's substantial in, uh, intensity differences. Because it depends only on the wave shape and not so much on how big it is. Now, on the other hand, the interval level difference processing part doesn't work so well, mm -hmm. and that would require synaptic adjustment. Sure. 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 So, so there, is, there is evidence for synaptic plasticity in this? Uh, um, there is in baby animals, so it must be there in adult animals, and I don't know. First of all, with respect to your last question, I can only contribute my personal experience, which is, you know, I have my ability to localize sound gets worse with time up there. So that's, you know, you would, uh, you would have hoped it would get better. It's getting worse all the time. But my question actually has to do with recruitment. Is there an analog or, you know, some parallel to recruitment in any other, like, sensory modality? Um, gee, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Be just as sensitive as it could possibly be. Um, 
That would be my guess. But that's just a guess. But that would the spontaneous activity have maintenance role within this uh, context of homeostatic plasticity in the cochlear process? Yeah, okay. So that's, is that, is that what you're asking? That's a different whole other question. And as you know, there's a model for tinnitus that's based on exactly that point, that following acoustic trauma, you get a loss of spontaneous activity in the auditory nerve, which is true. And as a result of that, you get um, sort of an increase in excitability or sensitivity of neurons in the cochlear nucleus, and this goes to produce the, uh, uh, the uh, phantom sound that you hear as tinnitus. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a standard model. I, I would say that the, that the source of tinnitus is not well understood. I don't like that model, but that's another whole lecture. So, but, but I think that it's, it's not one you can actually knock down. <laughs> you know? I don't like it for sort of aesthetic reasons. Uh, and, and I think that, that probably what we need are this fluctuating um, spontaneous activity, which you do see after, uh, after acoustic trauma. Uh, and in addition to that, um, you probably some of the disorganization of circuits that I described probably contributes in that in the neurons uh, begin to, to, to fire together in ensembles more than in, uh, in normal apps. But I'm way beyond the data at this point. This is a grand question. Yeah. Uh, it's all the maladaptive uh, mechanisms that are shown inside almost the miracle that the cochlear implants work. So, the location of the same. Well, as we discussed, uh, Cochlear implants are a remarkable device that uh, um, work much better than they have any right to. Uh, and it's probably because the, uh, the acoustic speech signal, which is what they really work well for, is extremely well designed to be robust, and we are so overtrained on it that we can get speech with absolute minimum of cues. Uh, yeah. Uh, cochlear implants do maintain central, central uh, neurons. Right? Uh, my colleague David Ryugo has devoted a good deal of time over the last 10 or 20 years to comparing the brains in cochlear nuclei in, in cats uh, uh, with uh, these are deaf white cats. So they're, they're completely deaf. And if you don't put a cochlear implant in them, they're, they're synapses in the cochlear nucleus are in much worse shape and anatomical, just their, 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 their morphology. Uh, smaller, less complex, less active zones, etc. than if you put a cochlear implant in. So presumably, the cochlear implant does maintain the central auditory system. Uh, there's a question about the uh, cochlear implants and the improvements of the auditory cortex when they're lip reading. I mean, I'm just a simple-minded engineer. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't think that is, but that's a very good question. This is a question. <laughs> right, so uh, 10 years ago, there was an industry that started all over the world to try to regenerate these hair cells because at that time, this was the most, the, the major cause of, de of, of deafness was damage to hair cells. And it hasn't been successful, partly because it, you can't just re regrow the hair cells, you have to regrow the whole cochlea. So you have to recapitulate the whole developmental sequence that leads to the cochlea. And we just don't have the genetic tools, the developmental tools to do that right now. So I think there's still a lot of people working on that problem. Uh, and I certainly spend a lot of money on it, and I, you know, I think it's, it's money well spent. 
but it, it's an extremely difficult problem. Recently, the problem's been made worse by the fact that, um, that there's actually a lot more degeneration of spiral ganglion neurons than was originally thought. Even in cases where the, the hair cells survive, you can actually have major degeneration of spiral ganglion neurons. And this is one of the things that happens as you get older. So a person my age probably has only half of these left on average. And a person who's 80 is probably down to 10 or 20 percent of them. Um, and so this seems to be a, just a developmental <coughs> process on and it, in, with acoustic trauma you get degeneration of spiral ganglion neurons due to a so-called excitotoxic problem here. If you, if you stimulate the hair cells very strongly they release a lot of glutamate uh, and they can actually kill the, the spiral ganglion neurons and the hair cell can survive. So you know, uh, that's a different whole problem. <laughs> but regenerating the hair cells, I mean that's something that, that being actively worked on is just a very difficult problem. Okay, thank you.